The first national park to be established among Utah's bottomless list of breathtaking parks and monuments, Zion is one of those places that starts to hurt your neck after a while, because everywhere you are there's something amazing to look up at, or to climb up to. Like many places in Utah, the park's formations were once inhabited by and subsequently named after a few different indigenous groups. Long before the first Europeans ever called this place sanctuary, it was home to the southern Paiute indigenous people, whose name for the canyon, Mukintawim, was the original name for the park when it first became a national monument in 1909. Isaac Behunin, one of the first Mormon settlers to call Zion home in 1861, said of the canyon, A man can worship God among these great cathedrals as well as in any man-made church. This is Zion. So let's go to Zion. Come on, it's easy, right? Let's go to Zion. Zion was ranked by National Geographic as the third most visited national park in the U.S. in 2023. And after spending a few days within like a 30-mile radius of the park, I can definitely attest to that. The park has a road running north-south along the banks of the Virgin River. But because the majority of the accessible area of the park is one long, narrow canyon, there is very little room for any parking whatsoever, let alone the amount of concrete that it would take to fit the 5,000 plus vehicles a day that visit Zion. So, to solve this problem, in 1999 the National Park Service established a shuttle system that runs the full length of the canyon from the visitor center, with nine different stops along the way. Vehicles entering the canyon can park at either the visitor center, or more likely in the nearby town of Springdale, and then from there, visitors can take the shuttle to any of the destinations within the park. Despite driving in within half an hour of the park's opening on a weekday, we weren't able to get a spot at the visitor center. Because, eh, well... So we drove to Springdale. We still couldn't find a spot, so we gave up and ate breakfast in town, finally got a spot, and then took the Springdale shuttle into the park, which stops at the visitor center and transfers over to the park shuttle. The total time in between driving into the park for the first time and actually getting to enter the park was around three and a half hours, and if we hadn't ditched our oatmeal and granola bars and gotten breakfast burritos in town, I'm not sure we would have made it. But, even with all of that considered, it was worth it the second we stepped in. The visitor center was pretty solid as far as national parks go, and then we got in line for the shuttle, which kind of felt like waiting in line for a Six Flags ride. But once we were on it, the ride was actually pretty impressive. The shuttles run constantly all day long, and the schedules are super consistent. Outside of the visitor center, the most that we ever had to wait for one was only five to six minutes, and most of them were even less than that. Something that we did not do but that also seemed like a pretty successful alternative was renting an e-bike in Springdale and riding up and down the length of the canyon. The road has a dedicated bike path that runs along the river, and all of the shuttle stops have plenty of bike rack space to accommodate the number of people who cycle throughout the canyon. And just like the shuttle, it felt like the park committed to the bike infrastructure and it paid off. Even without being surrounded by a stadium's worth of vehicles, and it genuinely was a noticeable difference seeing people walking everywhere and not a car in sight, the park was still very densely crowded, but I feel like in terms of big-name national parks, it wasn't too bad. Zion is one of those places that the crowds are just part of the experience, and if you want to go somewhere in Utah that looks like this but without all the people, I mean, pick a direction, it's Utah.
What's the verdict, Ranger Jake? Hmm. It's actually really clear. That's really good. That's some of the best river water I've tasted. I'm really Look at him. Look at him. Look at that little face. Look at that little bastard. It's you, closed. Sir. He's not getting into it, but. You, sir, are a criminal. You, sir? sir? Get. Oh. Do you mind? <laughs> Do you mind? Oh, you, you, you were not taking a bath on top of my back. Get! Oh my. Beyond the edge of the paved trail here is the Narrows, where the walls of the canyon close in on the Virgin River on either side. When the water level is low enough, which varies from year to year, the Narrows are open to hiking through the river itself, for as little as a two-mile walk through the beginning portion here to a 13-mile trek through the water down from a point farther up the river called the Chamberlain's Ranch. It's a journey that looks and sounds amazing, and of all of the features that were closed when we came, this one made me the saddest. Yo. Two chairs? That's kinda unusual. That's right, it's time for a new segment called Cooking with Ellie. So, Madame du jour, what are we making tonight? We're making tablitas, campfire style, with rice and ranch style beans with jalapeno peppers. Now, typically, this is best done with one of those fancy metal camping grills that goes over the fire pit. We don't have that part. Well, maybe we can find one. What do you think, a metal camping grill is just going to appear out of thin air? Are you kidding me? Tablitas, aka beef short rib, is where you take the rib cut of a cow and you cut it crosswise to make it short. These are a little thinner than I'd like to see it, but we work with what we've got. What makes these tablitas though is the marinade that you use. In there you've got oil, brown sugar, soy sauce, Worcestershire, I think that's how you say it, salt and pepper, triple the amount of garlic called for, and paprika, chili powder, and I think I already said salt and pepper. If you live in the Southwest, you can find these at any typical meat mart or like Mexican meat mart, even like a Fiesta will have them. Uh, living in Texas and Arizona, I'm used to this luxury and they'll typically have it pre-marinated for you. We were just going to our local place and they were out. So we DIY it in this house. Typically you cook these over a temperature controlled charcoal or really any type of grill. I personally like them over an open fire with a crap load of jar. It's so good. Yeah, something that I really love about this cut of meat is that you get giant juicy chunks of rendered fat right next to 
a super tender meat. And if you cook this over an open flame, especially if the flame touches it, it chars it in this way that just really completes the flavor. I'm eating this now. <laughs> I want to play around with it. Thank you. 